Hello and welcome to the University of Lancashire's Awesome Observatory again. And to this short video about one of the strangest consequences of the fact that we live in a universe which is expanding, namely cosmological time dilation. Now you may have heard of time dilation before and usually that will be in the context of Einstein's special or general theories of relativity. In those situations, it refers to the observed difference in elapsed time for two identical clocks which have a relative velocity or which are experiencing a difference in gravitational potential. So in short, a clock observed on a fast-moving object like a rocket will appear to run more slowly than one at rest relative to the observer. Likewise, a clock observed deeper in a gravitational potential well closer to the centre of the Earth, for example, will also appear to run more slowly than a clock further from the gravitational potential, sat on the top of a high mountain, for example. Both of these effects have been verified in the real world using extremely accurate atomic clocks. The differences measured, however, are extremely small, typically of the order of nanoseconds for most experiments. You really have to be moving very close to the speed of light or close, close to something extremely massive like a black hole for the effects of relativistic time dilation to become significant. Cosmological time dilation is a similar effect. It's an apparent change in the rate that time passes, but in this case it's caused by the expansion of space itself. Now, to understand why stretching space causes cosmological time dilation, it's useful to first think about what effect the stretching of space has on light. Light can be thought of as either a particle or a wave, and don't ask, frankly, it's a topic for a whole bunch of other videos. In this case, it makes more sense to think of it as a wave. So light propagates through space as an electromagnetic wave specifically. This is an oscillating, self-propagating combination of electric and magnetic fields. The distance over which the wave repeats is the wavelength, and for electromagnetic waves, it defines the energy of the wave and how we would describe it in day-to-day -day use. The highest energy electromagnetic radiation has very short wavelengths, of less than one one-hundredth of a nanometer, and it's typically called a gamma ray. At the other extreme are lower energy waves with wavelengths longer than 30 centimetres, which would typically be called radio waves. The light we see is sort of in the middle of these two extremes, with wavelengths around 500 nanometers. Now think about an electromagnetic wave travelling through space, a space that stretches. What happens to the wave? Well, it stretches too and it stretches in direct proportion to the amount that space expands. If the universe doubles in size during the light ray's journey, its wavelength will double too. And this is the cause of what astronomers call redshift. Light emitted by stars in distant galaxies might leave those galaxies as what we would perceive as blue light. But by the time it reaches us, it can have been stretched so much that its wavelength now makes it appear as red or even infrared light. And this is why all very, very distant galaxies appear to be red, even though they might be very actively forming stars and hence bright blue in colour if we were actually sat inside of them. Next, we should think about a pair of light waves travelling through the expanding space. Imagine the two light waves that set off from a point in a distant galaxy and travel to us, the observer. If they set off at slightly different times, say one second apart, they will have some distance between them. And as they are particles of light, and by definition travel at the speed of light, this distance will initially be the speed of light times one second, or almost 300 million metres most of the way to the moon. But on the wave's long journey to us, space is expanding. And this applies to the space between the pair of light waves as well. So by the time the waves arrive at Earth, the space between them will have increased, and therefore the second wave will have slightly further to travel than the first. 
This extra distance means that it takes a little longer for the second wave to reach us, it will be delayed compared to the first, and the gap in time between them will have grown. And in practice, this means that if you can observe the hands of a clock at larger and larger cosmological distances, it would appear that the clock ticked more and more slowly the further away you placed it. But how large is this effect? Well, thankfully, just like with redshift, the way time appears to slow down can be shown to be directly related to the amount by which the universe has expanded. If the universe has expanded by a factor of two, since our two light waves set off, then the distance between the waves will have also increased by a factor of two, and the corresponding event will appear to occur at half its actual speed. Now, interestingly, the reverse is also true. If we lived in a universe where there was sufficient mass and energy in it, the expansion of the universe would eventually slow down and stop. And then the universe would begin to collapse again, ending in the reverse of a big, pa big bang, what's known as a big crunch. Two light waves travelling while the universe was collapsing would find the distance between them shrinking. So in that situation, time would actually appear to speed up for events happening in distant galaxies. Now the fortunate thing is that nature has given us a clock that we can observe at cosmological distances. So we can actually measure whether or not time appears to slow down or speed up. Type 1a supernova are that clock. And type 1a supernova are runaway fusion explosions, essentially giant fusion bombs occurring in white dwarfs, which are the exposed cores of dead stars. For our story, what really matters is that these explosions are very, very bright, so we can see them at cosmological distances. And they always create a large amount of an isotope of nickel. About half the initial mass of the white dwarf, which is equal to 70% of the mass of our sun, gets converted into nickel-56 a form of nickel that is unstable with a half-life of just six days. This then decays into an unstable form of cobalt, which itself decays with a half-life of 77 days into stable iron-56. And it's these radioactive decays that produce, produce much of the visible power of a supernova. They therefore explain why supernova get brighter initially. When you think about it, most or basically all explosions are brightest immediately after going off. They fade quite quickly because the explosion is radiating away its energy and cooling down. Supernova are different. The radioactive decay of nickel to cobalt to iron adds energy to the initial expanding explosion, making the ejector hotter and brighter. And because these decays are governed by atomic physics, the time it takes for the supernova to reach the maximum brightness is always the same. Everywhere in the universe, it's about 15 days. That's just the time it takes for those radioactive decays to provide the maximum amount of power to the expanding supernova remnant. After this point, less and less unstable nickel is left behind to power the supernova. So the expanding supernova ejector starts to cool and becomes fainter over time again. Cosmological time dilation in a standard expanding universe predicts that the time taken for a supernova to reach peak brightness should increase with what's known as the scale factor, and hence a factor of 1 plus the redshift. So a supernova at a redshift of 1 should appear to take twice as long to reach maximum brightness. Now amazingly, this has been observed. Most recently, Ryan White at the University of Queensland and collaborators well, they measured the time it took to reach peak brightness for a sample of over 1,500 supernova observed with the Dark Energy Survey. And they found that the time taken to reach peak brightness scales with 1 plus the redshift perfectly, as you can see in this plot. In practice, this means that time can be slowed down by anything from zero for events that occur in our local group of galaxies, which are gravitationally bound and therefore are 
not expanding with the expansion of space, to a factor of 1,100 times slower for the most distant thing we can observe, the cosmic microwave background. So we have an excellent observational proof that the expansion of space indeed leads to an apparent slowing down of time. So now that we know that cosmological time dilation occurs, does it have any consequences? Well, yes, it's one of the main reasons why observing galaxies at greater and greater distance becomes harder and harder. We observe anything in space by recording the arrival of light from that object. And cosmological time dilation means that as an object is moved away, the rate that photons arrive drops off faster than expected if the universe was static. This causes the object to be fainter and therefore harder and harder for us to observe. So this is one of the main reasons why astronomers are working to build a generation of extremely large telescopes. Telescopes like the 25 meter diameter Giant Magellan Telescope under construction in Chile, or the 39 meter wide extremely large telescope, again under construction in Chile, and the 30 meter telescope, which as the name suggests, has a diameter of 30 meters, which will be built wherever they figure out they can put it. So the size of these telescopes is essential. They need the large collecting areas to be able to get enough light to study those distant and hence extremely faint first galaxies. It's the only way we're going to be able to actually work out the processes that go on when the very first galaxies are being born in our universe. So that was a brief introduction to cosmological time dilation. One of the simplest but also strangest consequences of the fact that we live in a universe where space can stretch. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, I hope you'll consider giving a like and subscribing. And if you have any thoughts or comments, please feel free to leave them below, and I will try to respond to them where I can. Thanks.